Gonna tell you guys a quick story. So, uh, this is Joe, and he's in his boring kind of enterprise job, working with his mammoth PC. And he looks over and he sees that there's this magic lamp, or lamp, sitting next to him. So he rubs on it. And he's bored to death. But suddenly, whoa, a genie appears. And the genie says, well, what if I could grant you one wish as long as it relates to software development? So he's like, hmm, I really want to work on cool stuff. OK, so the genie disappears. Well, a second later, his boss comes marching in, well, probably a day later. And he says, hey, I need you to build me a mobile app. So he's like, oh, cool, now I get to use like, new types of technology. And he says, uh, and he's been like a client-side developer, by the way. And uh, he says, oh, does it need to support you know, iOS? And he's like, yes. He's like, well, I have to have a Mac then. Boom. So then suddenly what the genie had told him would happen is happening. He's got the Mac now. So now here comes his boss. You've got your Mac. You better start getting busy. And he says, well, this app that we're building needs to have social sharing. I need to be able to share like Twitter, Facebook, whatever. So he starts to keep a backlog, and you know, that's what managers do. So OK, so I'm going to need a UI. I need a back end. I need a database. Uh, I need to have some type of authentication. And I need to have a place to put some type of server logic because of the fact that um, you know, client apps are great, but at some point, um, as those apps grow, you need to have a back end. And when you're in the kind of mobile world and you're building like a public facing app, the place where that's probably going to go nowadays is in the cloud. So you need some place where this logic is going to live that's going to run on the server, which we don't want on the client, because you're probably going to have multiple clients. And then he starts saying, oh, <laughs> needs to be able to have more Twitters and Facebook. So oh, so I need to now actually have OAuth, not just auth. So you're trudging away. And then you know Joe's trudging away. And then suddenly the manager comes back and says, this nonsense. Um, <laughs> Which basically translates in geek speak to push notifications. You need a way to be able to do push notifications. So OK, so you're like the list is growing. Now, you've never done any kind of development like this. And you need to have scheduled tasks to do those push notifications. Because push is just the mechanism that can push to the different mobile devices. But there needs to be some type of interval that logic will run that is going to then you know, generate these, these, these push notifications. So he's trudging along, and then suddenly the boss comes in and he says, well, why has the app disappeared? And he's like, what do you mean the app has disappeared? I, I put it, you know, it's in the Apple Store. And he's like, well, I looked on Google Play, and it's not there. OK, so it actually needs to be multi-platform. So I mean, this is turning into a pretty heavy task. Uh, and then when he thinks uh, you know, everything's all done, he comes in and he says, hey, it needs to support Google Glasses. So that means. It needs to also have a web UI. So in addition to the standard native UI, it also has to have web UI. Um, and then, so the app is getting built and it's working, and suddenly this new tester is brought in to kind of break the app. And he says, hey, I busted it. So I need to have diagnostics and whatever. So this is all tongue in cheek, but this is all like real stuff. And then finally, you find out you've been acquired. So this app needs to actually be able to scale. So this is, you know, and, and if you think about development today, um, this wouldn't all happen at once, but these kind of incremental things really happen, usually because managers just can't make up their mind what they want. Um, so they just keep coming with all these different requirements. Well, what Windows Azure Mobile Services is designed to do is to make um, everything that we saw in that list easier. Um, now, it doesn't solve every problem, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you this is like a magic solution to solve everything. But it does offer a really good set of functionality to get going. And it's designed to actually make certain uh, very common scenarios easy, but also to allow you to grow. Uh, for example, looking at scale. Um, you, know, you build your app today, and it's working great. But suddenly, now it needs to scale. What do you do? With Azure Mobile Services, when you build out your app, you're going to be designing it in a way that it can scale. The infrastructure is designed to scale. The infrastructure offers diagnostics. Um, looking at push notifications, um, every different device has a different mechanism. If you're working with, say, Android, you have to work with GCM. 
as the push. If you're working with iOS, you have APNS. If you're working with Windows Phone, um, there's, there's WNS. And if you're working with, uh, or there's MPNS. And if you're working with Windows 8, there's WNS. So there's all these different protocols. Um, with Azure Mobile Services, we're going to make it easy for you to push to all these different devices um, without having to become masters of all these different uh, protocols. Um, we have a scheduler, so you can schedule things in the back end, so you can do that marketing stuff. We have data. <laughs> That's a key thing. I need to be able to store my data in the cloud. And Azure Mobile Services is going to make it easy for me to build an app that can store data in the cloud and that can scale out. And then a very interesting feature that it has is this ability to do server-side logic without having to become a full-blown server-side developer. So it allows you to write JavaScript on the server, simple scripts, um, to execute business logic, but you don't have to own the entire backend. The backend is managed for you. So this is a prevailing pattern today, which is known as backend as a service. Um, and that's the term that people use. So you may have heard of platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is VMs running in the cloud. Backend as a service is basically a backend for a front end application that is running in the cloud and that is managed for you. So that's Azure Mobile Services. It supports all of these platforms, including HTML5. So you can even build PhoneGap, Cordova type applications, but you can also build uh, native iOS, Android, and Windows, uh, Windows Phone 8 applications. Now, <coughs> it is not a UI framework. So we're not telling you how to build the client. But what Azure Mobile Services will do is give you native SDKs for all these different platforms so that you can build your own client. We're not going to get in the way, if you're doing Windows development, of using the Infragistics controls, for example. Use Infragistics controls all day long. What this is going to be is a library that's going to make it easy for you to leverage that capability on the back end. And we're going to dive in and take a look at it. So um, <clears throat> to use Azure Mobile Services, we actually have a portal the Windows Azure portal. So if I go manage.windowsazure.com, we have an HTML5 portal. Um, how many people here actually have Azure accounts or have worked with Azure? Has anybody here used mobile services or is familiar? OK. So here I have mobile, a mobile service, uh, my collection of mobile services. So I'm going to go create a new mobile service. And it says, hey, I can create one. And um, I'm going to pick my URL. So I'll just call it GB to do three. And Azure Mobile Services creates a database for you behind the scenes. It uses Azure SQL database. But it's designed so that you don't have to really know about that database unless you want to. We'll see how that plays out. So I'm going to just uh, use an existing database instance. Sorry. That's OK. So I already have a database, so I'm just going to log into it. But it could have created for me a new one. So now it's going to create my mobile service. This one might run a little bit slow just because of the fact that uh, I've created it, a mobile service in a different data center than the database, which you should not do. But I'm just doing it for my account for now. So it's going to take a few seconds for the mobile service to spin up. And then we'll see what it actually gives us. And we will do this in minimized form so that you guys don't have to sit here for another hour. But it'll give you a taste of what you can do. Should take a couple of seconds. Yep. OK, it's done. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, how do you manage your backend changes um, so you'll have where you end up having different versions of the client to the to the back end? Is there a set of procedures as to versioning for the back end? We don't actually have that's a great question. Do we do anything for versioning? We don't do anything for versioning today. Um, we do allow you to implement your own version, versioning strategy. So for example, you could have query string parameters um, that specify version equals blah or something like that and you could write logic that way. 
um, which is what most mobile service customers are doing. We would be interested to hear what your feedback is on what you want to see for versioning. Um, the basic feedback we got so far from a lot of people that are using mobile services is, hey, make it so it's easy for me to do it. Don't force me down a path because everybody has a different versioning strategy. Uh, some, for example, actually version by having separate services, uh, which I don't think is which I don't think is a good idea. But they do that. But, but you don't provide any guidance out of the box. It's really up to the. Uh, yeah, the we probably will provide some. Um, I mean, it's still a very young product, um, so and I can definitely give that feedback if you think that it's a good idea. That uh, and you could email me gblock at microsoft.com and say, hey, you know, it's great. Like, if you don't have versioning built in, great. Give me a pointer on the different strategies and how I could do them. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, that we should do something like that. So I've now created this, and we see that I get a dashboard here. Um, and it says I can choose my platform. So I can choose HTML, JavaScript. I can choose iOS, Android. Who here has done any iOS development? Just a few. OK, for those of you that didn't, you're now going to see a beginner iOS app. Um, but we support all these different uh, platforms here. So I get this option to create a new app or connect to an existing. So we don't think that you're going to use this getting started experience every time you build something. All we want to do is make it really easy for you to get going. So one of the things you'll see here is because of the fact that I've selected iOS, it's telling me I need to install Xcode. That's the development environment for better or worse that you write iOS applications. Um, using Objective-C. I will keep my own opinions about Objective-C. Um, so the next thing it says is, hey, you can store data in your mobile service, but you need to have a table. So mobile services has this logical concept of a table. By default, tables are backed by a database table. Uh, and we will automatically create that for you, but you don't have to. So I'm going to go here and create a to-do item table. So I'm just going to click on that. And again, remember, this is just the getting started experience. So it now says, hey, we've created the to-do item table for you. And it says you can download and run your app. So regardless of which platform you choose, we will give you that starter application just to get you going so you can see how it works. But again, we expect completely in the future you will not use that. So I'm downloading this, which will give me an Xcode application. And one thing I want to show you before I run the app is that my mobile service now has a table. And that table actually does correspond to a to-do item table living in my SQL database that it's managing. Uh, or it, and it has no records. Um, this to-do item table currently has no fields. This is important. It has just an ID. There's no other fields there. Remember that. That's important to remember. So now what I'm going to do is open this project that was downloaded. And you can see that I've done this before. There's two and three. There's, there's a GB to do list two and a GB to do list one. Um, and I need to get the right one or it will fail. So let's see, where is it? There it is on the bottom. Now if you do this for Windows, you will also get a, you'll get a Windows 8 uh, application. Um, so you'll get what you expect. So now I'm going to open this up into Xcode. And I'm going to just run this using the iPad simulator. Which will take a few seconds. OK, so now it says I can create a new item, like do the demo. So what did this actually do? This used the Azure Mobile Services SDK, which is installed within this application, to go and now push this item up to the server. But remember, I had not created any fields. There was no fields on this. The table was schemaless other than an ID. So if we take a look on the server, what happens? We 
we can see that the table actually now has fields on it, text and complete. Why? By default, when you use Azure Mobile Services, we enable this thing called dynamic schema. And the idea of dynamic schema is to enable the client to drive the development. As I'm developing, I can say, hey, if I add a new field into my JSON payload that I'm sending across, then automatically that will get added to a table in the database, um, to the particular table that corresponds to the object that I'm pushing. I can disable that, though. So you wouldn't want to go into production that way. So we actually have a configure tab that you can go to where you can basically turn off dynamic schema. But it is very nice as you're developing to enable this because, and that's why we enable it by default because it just removes friction. You know, if we think about like with script CS and so we were trying to remove friction around writing C sharp, this is really just about removing friction about building this backend. But you easily turn it off just by going off here. Um, you also have full control over the SQL Server and the database. It is your SQL Server and your database. So you can query it using SQL tools, you can add indexes, you can add stored procedures, you can, you can do whatever you want. But we've designed it so that you don't really have to think about it uh, for the base scenarios. Now, why have we designed it that way? Because the first target of Azure Mobile Services is really going after a client-side developer who maybe has very little experience on the server. So it's really about how do we minimize that getting started experience to make it really easy. That being said, there's a ton of people that actually have experience working on the server who've just liked how simple mobile services is and we'll see how you can go much further. And so they, even though they understand server development, are still actually using it just because it makes their jobs easier. So now we have a table. Now tables are pretty interesting because uh, and this is where mobile services really shine. So we've seen that it's CRUD. I've got data. Um, and I could go into my Xcode app and see how it basically um, is working with um, uh, mobile services. There's like, there's like controllers and there's a, there's a service here. And that service um, is what talks actually to mobile services. You can see here that I'm instantiating this thing called an MS client. And that client is the mobile service client. And it gets two pieces of information. It gets the URL and it gets an application key. This key is not a secret. It's just an ID. Um, so really what mobile services is giving you is an HTTP API. When I create that table, I now get an API that I can hit over HTTP. By default, it won't let anybody hit that API unless they have uh, encoded their request properly with this app key. But I can turn it off just to show you um, that I don't, I don't need to have that key and I can just hit it right in a browser. So I'm um, going to go into my table here and go to my permissions. And right now you can see that read permission says anybody with application key. Now I can turn that up to say only authenticated users. And we actually support OAuth. We support Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, and uh, Microsoft account integration so that you can offer an app experience where your users can log in. You know, remember the manager who was saying, hey, I need, I need identity, I need Twitters and Facebooks and this, that, and the other. We make that really easy to do. Um, but I'm going to just open it up to say anybody can access it. And I'm going to save that. And once I save that, I can then hit this table right in the browser. So if I go back to my dashboard, you'll see that I have a URL for my mobile service. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to say table slash to do item. And we can see that I got back the ID. So. If you think, if, if any of you are familiar with like Ruby on Rails that does a whole bunch of convention stuff, what this is doing is saying, hey, if you create a table, you automatically have an API for accessing that over HTTP in a CRUD manner, which can be secured. Now, we all know that most applications are more sophisticated than CRUD. And you don't want all that logic living on the client, especially if you're supporting multiple clients. Because now, to change the logic means you must rev those clients. 
Not to mention that it means that clients could potentially work around it because your API is not enforcing it. It's only enforced within the client. Somebody could write a new client and just work around that. So this is, gets back to that, hey, I need a place to write code on the server. Well, Azure Mobile Services gives you that place to write stuff on the server. So we come into our table here. And um, if I click on my to-do item, I have another tab here called Script. Script is interesting. So what Script gives me is a place to write server-side logic when any one of these CRUD operations happens. I can manipulate data that's being read and further filter it. I can modify things that are getting inserted or even do validations. So let me show you a really simple example of that. So let's say that I want to have a timestamp whenever you go and create the item. So what I could do is I could say item.created at equals new date. Once I do this, I can run the existing client. This is the beauty of having the server-side logic. I can just run the existing client, and the next record that I add, you'll see what happens. So let's see, where is the simulator running? OK, another, another item. Okay. So we go back to our table and we browse it. And now we see that we've got a date tacked on. Because of the fact that I have the dynamic schema enabled, that automatically just modified the table. If I turn the dynamic schema off, I would actually get an error because of the fact that it's trying to put a field in that doesn't exist within the table. So you are in complete control. What happens if for some reason that logic failed? So, yep. Yep. Um, does that mean that this has to be, the application has to be always online, so it cannot work with offline data? That's a great question. Um, today, yes, um, although people are implementing their own offline solutions because of the fact that we have a mobile SDK and they can do that themselves. Um, we are, we consider this something that's very important and we've heard it over and over again and we are actually building an offline, uh, we are looking at offline and, and looking at building an offline solution um, which will allow synchronization of data and things like that. Okay. And I don't know if I was supposed to say that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> and second one is, you said uh, with the dynamic schema, for example, if we do not send complete anymore, that complete column, yep. does that mean it's going to get deleted? Or no, no, how, no, no, how no. do we delete no, the no, columns? No, the dynamic schema, the way you should think about it, so that's a great question. It, do, it never removes things, it's only additive. So you have to remove uh, Dynamic manually. schema simply will say that if this column was sent and dynamic, if this field was sent and dynamic schema is enabled, it will add it. It will never automatically remove it. You would have to go in the database to do that, or I think you can, yeah, you can, yeah, you can do it here too. Okay. So you can actually go and say, ooh, I don't like created at, I'm gonna delete it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we can do some pretty cool things there. Um, Really, I mean, it's limitless what you can kind of do here because as long as you can do it with JavaScript, you can do it here. Um, now, there's a limitation of what you can do in the box as far as what libraries and things you can reference. We actually have a whitelist of libraries. Um, if you watch my TechEd talk, I go deeper into that. My TechEd New Zealand talk, which will be online, or my TechEd uh, Australia talk, which should, should be online very shortly. Um, but I can do things like validation, you know, where I could say, I think I have a snippet here. Let me see where my snippet is. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's not the one I want. Okay. So here's, a, here's an example of where I might do something like validation, where I might check and say, hey, if the item.text.length is greater than or equal to 10, then I want to return a bad request. So I can do all that validation in one central place. Now, we also 
um, allow you to do what are called custom APIs. Because everything that's here is really with the notion that I'm just exposing a set of CRUD operations and I can add logic before or after that executes. By the way, this request.execute actually takes a JavaScript callback. So if I want to have logic that only executes after it has completed um, updating the database, I can do that. Or, you know, I might have logic, for example, like push notifications is a great example. Um, from my scripts, I can actually do push notifications. Um, I have access to push module that I can use in my script to say that whenever a record gets added, I want to send back a push notification to the user. And I would want to do that only if the database succeeded. If for some reason it failed, I don't want to do that push notification. Did you have a question? I think I kind of did. I kind of forgot now. It's getting late. Um, okay. No, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up, guys. <laughs> I, no, I no. You, it's actually, this, is, this, is, this, is actually, this is actually really good. Um, I forgot my questions, but I will have one request. Uh, is it on your roadmap to have Xamarin support? We have it today. Oh, you have it? Yeah. We have, we have a Xamarin. With iOS or? We have support for Xamarin for iOS and Android. All right. Thanks. Yeah. The Xamarin guys actually did that work. So Miguel and those guys actually did that work. You can search um, on their site. But yes, we are you using Xamarin. The library is actually quite yes. out of date. The what? The iOS library is actually quite out of date. It doesn't have custom APIs. They're going to add that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's just a point in time. You know, this is an agile. I mean, the, the cool thing about this project is it moves very fast. It's not the traditional Microsoft. We're doing releases every couple of weeks of new features, so it, yeah, there's some catch up. Um, the other thing we allow you to do, by the way, is custom API. So I'm just gonna create an API called hello, just to show you what this does. So what's the difference? Custom APIs are a place to say, what I really wanna do is have some logic that's exposed over HTTP, but it's not a table. It's not CRUD based, it might be, and the rest of Farines will kill me, it might be RPC, like go do this thing. Um, I won't recommend you do that, but you can. But anyway, so if we, if we click on this, you'll see that it's given me this uh, hello world. So I'm gonna, s so, and it's got for post and it's got forget. So of course you wouldn't actually do this. So I'm gonna go to the permissions and again, I'm gonna set it to say everyone. And once I do that, then um, I can now hit my mobile service um, and hit that API. So this is GB to do three. So GB to do three dot Azure Mobile. So instead of hitting um, my table, I'm going to hit API hello, and I get a message of hello world. If I was to lo if I lock that down though, did I close that? Just to show you that the auth actually is real. Um, if I go into my mobile service, and I change it so that you must be actually authenticated. So instead of using anybody with the application key, I'm going to say you must be an authenticated user. That means you must have a mobile service JOT token, for those of you that are familiar. And that JOT token can be uh, enabled through several different auth mechanisms, which is done under the identity tab. You can put your app key for Facebook, for Twitter, etc. But what will happen then is if I go back to hit this now, instead of giving me hello world, it should give me an unauthorized error, 401. Um, so it's doing the proper thing that you would expect for an API that's going to support uh, authentication. So we're, we're out of time, basically, but I'm going to show you one more cool thing just to get you to think how far you can actually go with this. Um, so everything you've seen me do is in the portal. The portal's kind of cool, but what if I want to, like as my app's going to really grow, I might want to use like this thing called version control. And up until now, we've not had that. Version control has been you better copy your scripts and save them somewhere in your own repo because you, know, you get this lightweight script experience in the browser, which is very nice for what I'm doing here, just kind of getting going. But my app's going to grow. So what I can do is from the dashboard, I can go here and uh, it says set up source control. 
So if I set up source control, I will actually get a Git endpoint that I can pull down all of the scripts for my app. But it opens a ton more, which is I have a whole talk on this at TechEd. Uh, but to give you the brief version, once I have that endpoint, and I can also integrate with GitHub, because we give the post event hook. So you'll see in a minute uh, when it finishes, it will, uh, it will show me that. Let me go back here and refresh. It should be done already. Um, so I can do a GitHub post event hook. But once I open up into source control, well, first I can now use whatever editor I want. I'm no longer restricted to the browser. And I can commit and push and things like that. Um, but I can also, um, let's see, where is it? Source control. It's there, but why isn't it showing it? Reset your source control. Um, I can also use node modules. I can actually add node modules, and there's 40,000 of them, I told you before, when we were talking about, um, when we were talking about script CS. So those modules allow me to do some really rich stuff. And so one of the things that you could do, for example, is talk to Redis. So Redis is an in-memory database store. It's very, very fast. It's distributed. It can run on dedicated machines. And in Azure, we don't have Redis as a service yet. But what we do have is the ability to very easily spin up a VM that's running Redis. And it's all pre-configured. Um, if you're working with Windows Azure, I highly recommend that you check out VM Depot. And in VM Depot, you'll find a Redis image. And we have a command line tool that you can simply, it will give you the command that you run, and a few minutes later, you'll actually have a Redis instance up and running. You don't have to touch it or anything. So imagine a scenario, and this is absolutely my last thing, um, of where I have a products API. So that products API returns a list of products. So I'll just show it to you. So I'll go to uh, GB products dot azuremobile.net and I'll go to tables slash product. So that's going to take a few seconds. So you see I got a JSON list of about 10 different products. So the Redis scenario here is imagine this has like a million products, not 10 because you would be an idiot to use Redis for what I'm going to show now, um, is I basically want to capture data whenever reads happen. I want to capture which products are being looked at and how often. Um, and I want to know, I mean, how many, how many times they've been looked at and also what are the most recent products. So this is the kind of thing that I would never want to do on a database because I would not want to write to the database every single time somebody reads. That would be a contention nightmare. But Redis can handle that very, very well because it's an in-memory store. It doesn't have that kind of contention the way the model works. So what I've got here is I can go and say, show me the recent products. And this is an example of where I'm using API and table. So I can go API slash recent, and it will show me the most recent five products that were accessed. And I can also look at individual products by going like stats ID equals two. Um, should show me when it comes back the, oh, let's try one, the number of times that that has been accessed. So just showing you quickly how that was possible. And this is actually the very last. products. Okay, so I'm going to go into Sublime Text. This is because I've used Git, so I now have a service folder. And in that service folder, I now have API. I have modules, so I've gone ahead and installed the Redis module using NPM, which is the Node Package Manager. And I've pushed that into my repo. And then in my table, I have a read script and that read script is actually instantiating Redis, connecting to my Redis instance that I deployed in Windows Azure. And every time somebody reads, Redis has a concept of lists. And I can push things onto lists and I can truncate them. So I've got a list called recent and I'm pushing the most uh, recent, the ID that the person has requested on. So I can check and say, oh, that was the most recent one that was requested. And then I'm trimming it. 
And then I'm also doing this nice feature that Redis has. I'm using increment. And increment will go and take the number that's associated with the key f of the product and the ID, and it will increment it. So this way, if I do it three times, that number goes up. Um, and then this is using the Redis standard node module. It has this exec function that allows it to uh, execute a batch of things in a single command instead of doing each of those as separate requests because I don't want to have multiple requests. Um, and so, you know, this, this is actually really, really nice. Now I can take my mobile service much, much further. So NPM opens up a world of possibilities. You could talk to MongoDB, RabbitMQ, uh, geolocation services, Twitter, wh whatever you want to do is possible, uh, e both in APIs and in tables. But you got to be using the source control feature to be able to plug those things in. Um, and just showing you the very last, like if we look at, say, like the recent API is now going and grabbing the list of recent and just returning it back. So anyway, if you want to find out more on Azure Mobile Services, and I've just touched the surface, <coughs> there's a lot more that Azure Mobile Services can do. Um, if you go to windowsazure.com, I'm really proud of the Dev Center we have here. And I say that because often we've done not such a great job. But we actually have really good documentation and tutorials, whether you're talking about iOS, Android, HTML5, Windows Phone, and we have Xamarin stuff that will be coming soon in the future. We've also done work with Sencha Touch. I don't know if any of you guys here know about Sencha but we actually have a Sencha SDK that allows you to uh, access mobile services from within your Sencha apps. Um, and you can always email me, gblock at microsoft.com. And with that, I am officially done. Thank you guys very, very much for coming out tonight. Did you get all that? We'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now.